Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Lawsuit filed against Foreign Affairs Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith over donations in failed Commonwealth Secretary General bid. Trade unionist calls for parliamentary involvement in the Joint Industrial Council. And later in sports, semi-final lineup to be completed in JFF Link Cup. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shane Masters and here are the details. A suit has been filed in the Supreme Court to compel the government to come clean over the donations for the failed attempt of Foreign Affairs Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith to be elected Commonwealth Secretary General. Mrs. Johnson-Smith ran an unsuccessful campaign to unseat the current Secretary General in a multi-million dollar effort that saw her crisscrossing the globe to shore up support from Commonwealth leaders. The costly endeavor saw donations coming in from several quarters, including the Muslim group Grace Kennedy and businessman Keith Duncan. An attempt was made by U.S.-based Jamaican Wilfred Rattigan through the Access to Information Act to obtain full disclosure on the donors and the amount of money that was pumped into the campaign of Johnson Smith. The Ministry of Finance indicated that it was not in possession of any document detailing the source of the donations. Attorney for Mr. Rattigan, Sophia Bryant, says the suit was filed so that the state and its representatives can answer questions surrounding their failure to file the relevant documents in accordance with the applicable legislation. Administrative regulations governing a gift or or gift store donation in the amount of nine cent thousand United States dollars. The third respondent, being the Ministry of Finance, fails to take appropriate action to compel the first and second respondent to comply with the applicable statutory and administrative regulations. And this is centered around the gift. And then that the first respondent fails to disclose with the integrity commission regarding a gift or donation that was received that didn't fall within the filing exception and is obliged to file disclosure with the integrity commission. Union representatives have been reacting to the Labour Minister's comments regarding security guards. While welcoming aspects of his announcement, they believe the response to the ongoing issues is woefully lacking. Details from Hal Shane Burke. Trade unionist Vincent Morrison, while welcoming the Labour Minister's announcement that a joint industrial council would be established, says the process will need parliamentary involvement. On Wednesday, Labour Minister Carl Samuda announced that a committee would be set up to establish a joint industrial council for the regulation of the security industry and protection of security guards. Speaking with TVJ News, Mr Morrison says he believes the council would need the involvement of parliamentary members to make effective changes. If you want the council to be effective and not just uh, a, a rubber stamp here or there, parliament has to have a role in this. Eh? You know, there, there, there has to be some parliamentary uh, approval to, 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 to the whole situation. We don't know what has been done so far, but we're not going to throw the baby with the bathwater at this point. We are going to wait and see going down the road. He also dismissed the suggestion by the Labour Minister that guards should bring individual complaints to the Ministry's attention to have them addressed. He says the setting up of the Council would assist in handling complaints. We have to put in this mechanism to effect a balance between management and labor. You can't have a situation where you're asking 25,000 workers to write a letter to the ministry or to report X, Y, Z. That don't make sense. So the JIC is important. In the meantime, President of the Jamaica Association for Private Security, Teddy Lee Gray, says he was hoping that the Labour Minister would have outlined measures by the government to protect the guards from making decisions out of desperation. His comments follows the announcement by Mr. Samuda that 85% of the 25,000 security guards have already signed the new contracts. So we expect the minister to announce, you know, that, hey, you know, the government will give you um, security officers protection or the law supersedes um, any contract that any company wants to give you. So at least more the 15% who haven't signed as yet would have signed them. You know, but so that's the um, meat of the matter. Al Shane Burke, TVJ News.
the government has sought to provide clarity on the recent reports alleging visa restrictions of Jamaicans to Belize. There have been reports of Jamaican travelers exploiting the Central American country to get to Mexico and then across the border into the United States. During the recent post-cabinet press briefing, Information Minister Robert Morgan indicated that the Foreign Affairs Minister, Kamina Johnson-Smith, received an update from the Belizean government. He says the visa requirement applies to Haitians and not Jamaicans. Visa requirements on Haitians traveling to Belize, but the matter for Jamaicans traveling to Belize was under review, but they would not impose visa requirements on Jamaicans at this time. Amidst increased incorporation of technology in the education sector, there's growing concern about cybersecurity among schools. It's why stakeholders have collaborated with cybersecurity experts to discuss emerging threats and ways to protect against them. More in this report. For principal of Papin High School, Leighton Christie, educational technology like web-based RenWeb has undoubtedly bolstered the local school system. From the registration process, we have started gathering information on each student that is in the school. We are able to track students. We are able to track them through the grades. We have a management team that is set up to manage the RenWeb. In each grade, we have a RenWeb manager in terms of data collection for the institution. And it is uh, working very well for us. But with reports of hackers plaguing several sectors, there is concern that local schools may soon be impacted as well. Schools collect information on thousands of students and parents to include personal data like TRNs and even banking information. After cybersecurity and data protection luncheon put on by stakeholders on Wednesday, opposition spokesperson on education, Damian Crawford, explained that as other sectors tighten their security, it may just be a matter of time before schools are targeted. The people who used to mine it from Facebook, with the pressures of Facebook and the importance now Facebook is putting in to protect their data, may soon start to try and mine it from the Queen's School or try to mine it from Campion, or try to mine it from Papine, because there's greater, greater pressures, and there's also greater, greater value. So there's going to be, from persons of less than moral standing, to seek to find data wherever it exists. For financial services cybersecurity expert Mike Wright, focus should be on three cyber threats common to schools, as they account for 80% of attacks in the United States. These are system intrusion, basic web application attacks, and miscellaneous errors. He explains that the smallest breach can be problematic. It's not just personal information, it's uh, credentials. Those are things like passwords, which, you know, if you're using the same password at school that you are for your personal email, that sort of thing, right? Uh, you can see how that sort of information can be useful to the bad guys. As a preventative measure, Mr. Wright suggested a number of school-centered security resources. There's another organization, K-12-6, stands for Security Information Exchange. I highly recommend anybody involved in the education space, check out their website. So they're, they're, they're based in the U.S., but they have an international focus about just protecting the information of one of our most vulnerable populations, right? Our kids. They've also suggested periodic training to enhance the more cybersecurity aware culture at schools. Please stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. The Manchester police are investigating the circumstances surrounding the death of a 14-year-old girl after she reported a consumed or harmful chemical. The, the teen, Athena Williams, was found in her room in Coffee Grove District, Manchester, Sunday night. Information reaching our news team is that her grandmother heard strange sounds coming from her and went to investigate. The child's mother, who lives nearby, was called and she was rushed to hospital. However, Athena died two days later. And it's now time for the Business Minute. The cost of clothes and footwear increased by 5.9% for the 12 months up to March this year. The Statistical Institute of Jamaica says for the month of March alone, clothing saw inflation of 0.4%. Footwear registered increases of 0.6%. 
Statin says the higher prices for garments was the main contributor to the increase for the clothing group, while higher costs for shoes and other footwear impacted the index for the overall footwear group. Further afield, current or former Facebook users can now file for compensation as part of a $725 million settlement. The money comes from a class action lawsuit over Cambridge Analytica and other third parties using Facebook users' private information without their consent. In 2018, news broke that the data mining firm had taken personal information from up to 87 million Facebook users through a personality quiz app that sparked the lawsuit. Parent company Meta has denied any wrongdoing but agreed to the settlement in December to avoid the costs and risks of continuing the case. The agreement was given a preliminary OK by a federal judge at the end of March. A final approval hearing is set for September. And that's the Business Minute. I'm Hal Shane Burke. Time now for the top regional and international stories. In the region, the Suriname government is expressing concern about the heavy influx of Asian migrants, mainly nationals from India and Pakistan. They say it is also worrying several neighboring countries with concerns being raised through informal contacts. It is reported that most of the Asians are coming to the dot speaking Caricom nation via Trinidad and Tobago. They also end up in Guyana using illegal routes. Authorities say they are working with U.S. officials to detect any threat to the countries. On the international scene, the Yemeni police are investigating the death of 78 people, including women and children, who were crushed at a school during a charity distribution for Ramadan. More than 300 authors were injured during the incident in the Yemeni capital, Sana'a. It's understood that hundreds of people reportedly crowded the school late Wednesday to receive donations amounting to nine U.S. dollars per person. The two local businessmen responsible for the distribution have been arrested. Authorities blame the incident on random distribution of funds without coordination with local officials. And the paramilitary group clashing with Sudan's army has threatened to unravel the latest attempt at a ceasefire as foreign governments looked for ways to remove their citizens trapped in the conflict. The 24-hour ceasefire, which came into effect Wednesday evening, is the most significant attempt yet to halt violence between the military and the paramilitary rapid support forces. More than 300 people have been killed and 3,300 wounded in the fighting since it began on Saturday. And those are the top regional and international stories. I'm Carrie Ann Simpson. Thanks, Carrie Ann. We head to a quick break. When we return, Spencer Donington will have your midday sports report.